Hey everybody, um, I'm just getting started with the chapter six lab. So chapter six lab is going to be a little more than chapter six. Chapter six is a discussion of the what if analysis tool, basically. It is a discussion of everything that happens here in the data tab under, under this what if analysis. So we go through scenario manager, goal seek, and data tables. Data tables are typically the most complex part of this for students. They don't really understand how they work. They can do them sometimes, but they don't understand the why. As you've discovered all semester, they don't always know why we're doing things and why they're working the way that they do. Data tables are no different, so I'll try and explain those in a good depth of detail. Another thing you, guys, you need to be aware of is that students are having to use the solver for their homework. The solver in Excel, I don't know if any of you ever have ever used it, but it's very, very volatile. So it works sometimes. And what I mean by that is we could run the solver with all 500 of our students on Friday in lab and get probably 300 different answers based on what's on our screen. So you have to control it down to the very last minute detail and sometimes students don't understand constraints and they don't get things in there the right way. And so Solver is a little above what I'm expecting of them in this class. So we will use Solver for homework, but we won't use Solver on an exam, for example, because it is just too volatile and it's not really fair to the students. I'm asking a lot of them as it is, and I know that. And so I don't want to throw something at them that I know to be just... Um, very, very difficult to deal with. So we won't do solver. We probably won't even do it in lab. I covered it in class, in lecture. Um, we talked about it and I've recorded a video to help them with their grader project on it. But that's about as far as I'm going to go because like I said, it's pretty volatile. So the lab this week, I don't think is that difficult. It should be a lot of a refresher. But then again, the lab that we did last week that I thought was going to be a refresher didn't quite work out that way. So the students are really struggling with the why. They're really struggling with how do I figure out what formula I need to answer this business question? Because that's what this class is all about. That's the whole point of taking an Excel class. It isn't to follow along. It isn't to learn where to point and click because I can send you Linda videos or you can Google that all day long. The point of this class and any Excel class, in my opinion, that's worth anything is to teach you why you're doing things, not just how to do them. So you'll notice that the students are really starting to struggle with the why. The technical part of it, it's difficult, but it's impossible without knowing the why. So we're going to do a couple of more difficult things today. But I want you to remind your students that there is additional help. So lab what it is designed for and remind them of this. Lab, what it's designed for is for you to create muscle memory. For you as GTAs to go through this with them, show them how it works, sort of explain the why, but mostly show them how it works. I post help videos for all the labs where I do nothing but explain why. I do show how it works and what to type in, but I explain the why in great detail. It is a requirement of this class that they participate in all aspects of it. It's almost impossible to get through my exams without knowing the why. So it's really, really important, especially as we move forward. So just so you know, this is what the lab entails for this week. Our first tab is going to be called budget. And on this budget tab, we are going to do that what if analysis. We're going to do goal seek and we're going to do a one variable data table and a two variable data table all in this one. I'll come back to it because it's something that's probably new to you. So I want to spend a little extra time on it. So I'll come back to it. You can start with it in lab or you can finish with it in lab. It makes no difference to me. I don't care what order you teach it in. Start with um, whatever you want. It doesn't make any difference. But I'll come back to this one probably because you guys haven't worked with this as much. And we will come back to this. This customer discount tab has a new format of data. So this one is asking to calculate the discount for each customer. This is an if and statement. And it's a wicked one. It's a nested if and. So we're going to work through this one together. Again, this is a little difficult until you realize what's happening. And once you realize the pieces of a nested function, it becomes easier. If they don't practice it, if they don't get the logic, they're never going to understand it. They're never going to be able to do it. There is a nested if and on the exam. 
I don't expect you to tell them that. But now that we've done it, this is the third time, I would expect that they would have figured that out by now. So this one is nested if and, and I'll come back to this one again in a second. The sales by district is the index match portion of this lab. And you'll notice there is data for days here in this index match function. And it says, please create data validation lists that represent the month and the state. So we're going to create two data validation lists and then we're going to do an index match to look it up by the month and the state, obviously. Now, what's cool about this one is the state is all the way on the right hand side of the data, not on the left hand side. That's what makes it cool with an index match. I don't have to have my lookup value on the left hand side of this table. So this is the first time we're legitimately showing that. So the lookup value is all the way on the right hand side of the table. I'll come back to that in a minute as well. Just trying to give you a rundown of what we're going to do. This last one is going to be, oh, this isn't the last one, but this employee pay tab is going to be subtotals and pivot tables. So in my personal opinion, the absolute easiest thing in this entire lab is right here, subtotals and pivot tables. I don't think that they're hard. I don't think that they require a whole lot of explanation. You should show the students how to do them. But again, I don't think it's that difficult. The easiest tab I say for last, this is the rates tab. So here you have four options and it's asking you to find five things. So this is all of the different payment functions that we have talked about in lecture class and that they have done homework on. All of them we haven't necessarily used, but we have come in contact with a good many of them. So let's get started on this tab. This is the one that I want to talk about first. So this uh, mortgage, mortgage options and these um, car loan options, they have different formulas that they're asking you for. So the first one is asking you for the present value of the loan. The present value of the loan is whatever the total amount that we're going to borrow is. There's a formula for it. It is equals, and I'm going to put minus because I know it's going to happen, minus present value, not PFV, but just present value. Present value is asking me for a rate. Here is an annual interest rate. When I have an annual interest rate, I'm going to divide by 12. I have number of payments. The loan term is in years. The loan term is in years. The interest rate is in years. My payment is in months. So I've got to have it all in months. So my number of payments is going to be 30, this time times 12, because I have to have it in months. My payment value is going to be right there. It already gives me my payment value. I have a future value and a type that are both optional arguments in this present value function. I don't care about them. So I will just ignore them for now. We will always assume future value is zero and type is zero in this class. And if that's the case. We don't have to put anything, so we won't. Present value of the car comes out to be 276000 or home, not car, sorry, $276,868.93, and we're off and running. The next one says, okay, give me the term. Give me the loan, the term of the loan in years. Give it to me in years. So the formula here is equals and we're going to say negative because we always have those in these payment functions. This one's NPER. I bet you could have guessed that. Number of periods. So here I have an annual interest rate, which I will again divide by 12 because I have a monthly payment. Annual interest rate, monthly payment, and I have a present value of the loan. Here the present value is going to be the price of the home minus the down payment. Last two arguments, future value and type. I don't need that. I can simply hit enter. You'll notice when I hit enter, I have the term of the loan. Well, I want the term of the loan in years. If my payments are in months and my interest rate is in months, what do you think my term of my loan is right now? Well, you guessed it. It's in months. If I want it in years, it's as simple as divided by 12. So 107 divided by 12 is 8.9443. So I can do this. I can make this a smaller number. I can show it with only 
the number showing. It doesn't matter. I don't give you any of those instructions in this thing, but that's how you would change it. Like I can change it to just a regular number. It says nine years, round it to the nearest year. If I want it to be 8.94 years, I can do that. It doesn't really make any difference, but I can do a lot of things. Monthly payment, you guys know this one. This is equals minus PMT. The monthly payment is as simple as that. Annual interest rate, again, divided by 12. Number of periods is going to be 4, this time times 12, because, again, I want all of this in the same term. I hit I-12, so that wasn't helpful. So times 12. Present value of the loan here is going to be the price of the car minus my down payment. Don't let them forget the down payment. And we'll close off that monthly payment, and we're off and running. Total interest paid on the life of a loan. When I, we talked about this in class, and you guys weren't there, but they know this. The total interest paid on the life of a loan is going to be a cumulative interest payment. So here I have equals negative C-U-M. I can't type today, sorry. I-P-M-T, so cumulative interest payment. I have an annual interest rate. Again, I have a monthly payment, so it's divided by 12. I have number of periods, 5 times 12. Again, I have my present value of my loan. My present value is going to be the price of the car minus the down payment. So the price of the car minus down payment. It's kind of tricky for me to click on. So price of the car minus the down payment is going to be, in this case, D23 minus D25. My start period is going to be 1. It's always going to be 1, so I can type 1 in here. My ending period is going to be 5 times 12, because that's how many months I have. My last argument in the cumulative interest payment function is the type of the loan. I'm not dealing with that. That's a finance 301 situation. I'm not dealing with what type of loan it is, so I will stick with 0. But know that that is not an optional argument here. So I have to put that in for cumulative interest payment. Then I should get $4,089.95. So what is the total price of option four? What's the total price of this car that I'm going to buy? Well, the total price is equal to the price of the car plus the total interest that I pay plus my down payment. $36,089.95. And we're off and running. So hopefully that's pretty easy. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to do employee pay. So please use subtotals to show each total scholarship by semester. So this is pretty easy. I'm going to click inside this data somewhere. I'm going to go to the data tab over here on the right hand side of the ribbon and I'm going to hit subtotal. Actually I'm not going to do this this way because if I do this it's going to be a train wreck. So first I'm going to sort. And now I'm going to sort by student. And then I'm going to add a level, and I'm going to say sort by student, then sort by semester. And I'm going to hit OK. Now I have all of student A together, all of student B together, all of student C together. If I had just gone over and clicked subtotal, I would have had a mess on my hands. So make sure that you sort by student and then by semester. Then you can go to subtotal and say at each change in student. So I want a subtotal for each student, and I want to use the sum function for the amount of scholarship money. Okay, I can do that. And replace current subtotals, that's totally fine. This is fine for now. So this is going to give me, if I click on these numbers, student A's total, student A is going to have a subtotal, if I scroll down um, to the subtotal, student A will have a subtotal right there. But I wanna know each student's scholarship by semester. So to do that, I have to add an additional subtotal. So here I wanna do it at each change in semester. And I still want to sum the amount of scholarship money. I'll uncheck this box that says replace current subtotals, which will allow me to add a layer of subtotals. And I will click OK. So now you'll see I have student A's fall, spring, summer, total, so on and so forth. So again, I can click these buttons to collapse and um, expand. So what is happening here, if I click on the three, is I have each semester total for student A and the student A total at the bottom. I can still click number two to go all the way to the student total, so on and so forth. So that's how you would sort that with subtotals.
So additionally, place a pivot table in another tab to show. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and I'm going to remove all these subtotals. Remove all. I'm going to remove all the subtotals just because I want to make a pivot table out of it. And making a pivot table out of it is much easier if I don't have those subtotals there. So I'm going to remove them. What you can do in class if you want to show them both and they want to save both, before you start the subtotals, you can have them make a copy. So to make a copy of this tab, you go down and you right click the tab identifier at the bottom of the sheet name and you select move or copy. This is actually probably a really good lesson for them. They don't know how to do this yet, so that'll be really helpful. Then say I want to create a copy and I want to just do it in this workbook. So I want to create a copy and click OK. Then you'll have two employee pay things. You can do subtotals on one and pivot table on the other. It'll work out great. But for now, let's do a pivot table.